Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. When my aunt was about 11 or 12 years old, she was helping her older cousin Jerry in the field at her aunt's house in an area called Screamer in Henry County, Alabama. It was a hot day, and after some time, Jerry grew very thirsty and asked my aunt to walk up the road to the house and get him a glass of water. My aunt then walked through the field, back toward the dirt road leading to her aunt's house. Upon reaching the dirt road, she saw two creatures standing on the other side of the road. She stopped and began slowly backing up, then stopped again. She stood there looking at them, and they looking at her, for a minute or so, long enough for her to get a good look at them. They were only around ten feet away from her at that point. She on one side of the dirt road, and they on the other. She described them as standing next to each other, one was, in her estimation, around five feet tall, and the other one was slightly shorter, around four feet tall. She said that she got the impression that they were young. She said that they were real hairy and completely covered in dark brownish-black hair, that they looked sort of like gorillas, but with human-looking faces with hair on them, human-looking hands, and human-looking feet. She said their noses were free of hair, and the color of their noses was dark brown or black, as were their hands and feet. They stood very still, other than blinking, just looking at her. Except for being covered in thick hair, their faces looked human, with regular human-looking noses. After a minute or so, she took off running as fast as she could back up to the house to get the water Jerry had requested. She did not look back as she ran. She got the water and proceeded to walk back toward the field. The creatures were not there anymore. She never told anyone about this incident for many years because she was always afraid people would make fun of her. At the time of the sighting, there was only one house along that road, and the road was not paved. It was a dirt country road. The other side of the road where the Bigfoots were seen standing together was extremely dense forestry and trees for miles and miles. The opposite side of the road was a large cornfield where the witness and her cousin were working putting soda on the corn, also known as fertilizing the corn. For the witness's aunt, who owned the cornfield, her cousin still lives there, in the same house where he lived at the time of the sighting. On to the next story. I was born and raised in Aliceville, Alabama, about a quarter of a mile from City Park. In 1958, I was 14 years old. I played in the woods south of the park and swam in the creek nearly every day. One afternoon, just before dark, I had been down near the creek at the small pond. This was before the city built the sewer lagoon on the property. At that time, there was a 20 or so acre sagebrush patch there where they had not cultivated for years. That afternoon, while walking from the lake back across the west end of that field, I saw something walking a path along the eastern end. At first, I thought it to be a huge man. The five-foot-tall sagebrush was striking him about the waist. It was in plain sight for about 50 yards and turned and went back into the woods. It must have been eight feet tall and walked with its head slightly bent forward. It was very dark in color. I could tell it was the same color from the waist up to the top of its head. The longer I looked, I knew it wasn't human. I ran home and told my parents, but I don't think they believed me. I never went in those woods alone again until I was much older. On to the next story. This happened in Elkmont, in Limestone County in Alabama. It was cold and had been snowing a little, and my brother-in-law and I went deer hunting. We got to a place that he said he knew deer were. I walked down the path about a quarter of a mile from him, and after a few minutes, I heard something in the brushes around some trees. Behind me was a great big hill, very tall. As I eased around the trees to see, 
there was a big buck deer hung up in the bushes by its antlers. I had a shotgun with a slug in it, and as I got the deer in my sights, the deer turned its head and looked at me. It just stood there. It never ran. Like I said, I wasn't into hunting, and I didn't shoot him. I couldn't. I was 16 years old, and this was my first time deer hunting, and also my last. I walked back and found my brother-in-law and told him what had happened, and if he wanted the deer, I'd show him where it was. We walked back to find the deer gone, and nothing left but velvet. This is when my brother-in-law told me what the deer was doing, and that was rubbing the velvet from its antlers. Like I said, I'd never been deer hunting and didn't know this back then. While I was there, I noticed a small stream of water running out of a small opening at the bottom of a hill. I had no flashlight with me and could only see that it did go back up into the hill. Some friends and I had been exploring caves that were around the area. A few days later, I saw my best friend and told him of the opening, and he and I went back to this location with a flashlight. We got to the opening and knelt on the right side of the stream, and he on the left. The opening was about two feet high and maybe a foot and a half wide with a stream of water that was about eight inches wide running out of it. We both got on down and laid on the ground, looking into the opening, shining the light inside. The weather that day was cloudy, and it had been raining, so lying on the ground was not that great. Anyway, I shined the light and saw about two feet into the opening. That, it opened up into what looked like a big room in a cave. We were talking about how big it was, and as I shined the light into the left, I saw that there was a turn to the left. That is when something big Harry and bare-chested walked into the light. I turned and asked, what is that? Only to find that my friend had jumped up and was gone. I jumped up and ran after him and asked him again what he thought it was. And his reply was, what? I've never been back to that location. I know that whatever it was had to get in there another way. I told a few people and they laughed at me. Some said that there were a few old Indians that lived back up in there But if they did, I never saw them. My friend that was with me, well, we grew up together and I knew him like a book. He lived and stayed at our house 90% of the time. And I know he saw something because he was just as scared as I was that day. I haven't seen him in almost 23 years now. I went on to become a police officer and he's into management of a water department. That day, I know what I saw and no one believed me and it has never been checked out, and he and I never went cave exploring again. All I can tell you is that I saw a turn to the left, and as I shined the light, I could see a little into the turn and was trying to get a better look. This is when something came from around the turn and walked into the light from the turn. I was scared, and it all happened in seconds, but what I saw was big, hairy, and bare-chested. I was not looking for anything. We were just seeing if this was a cave. It was, but something lived there. I've wondered about this for 32 years on and off, but I will say with all my heart it was ape-like and I will take a lie detector test on it. On to the next story. In 1997, we planned a family camp out near Olive Lake in Oregon. I worked at the time with a fellow who raved about this area and had been there several times himself. So we planned a week packing up everything we would need for this little vacation in the woods. At the time, our two children, Sophia and little Eddie, were 12 and 16 years old, respectively, were in excellent physical condition and both being very athletic. And so we planned to do an extensive amount of exploration in the form of hiking. On the fourth day of our camp out, we headed north into the Amatilla National Forest with our goal for the day being the base of Desolation Butte, a 7,000 foot mountain to our northwest. We had hiked about four miles, crossing over what I would say was a secondary road, with the butte now dead north of us. As we re-entered the wilderness to continue our hike, we were entering an area of the woods that was very undulating. It was an up and down and all around walk where our forward visibility was extremely limited. As far as we could see ahead of us, for the most part, we were following some apparent game trails as well as some open areas in the trees. Now, I have to tell you, before I get into what happened next, B 
because it all unfolded so quickly that each of us was carrying a canister of bear spray. Between reading the instructions and coaching the kids in its use, I remembered the spray had an effective range of 12 to 40 feet, and that if to be truly effective, it needed to contact the eyes and the nose. These were basically large canisters of pepper spray. Our family at the time was in what I would call quiet mode. In other words, during the hike, there were times when we were jabbering like magpies, and other times we were quiet, focusing on the task at hand and taking in the surroundings. This was one of the latter. What happened next was so frightening and had happened so quickly that frankly it was hard to believe. I was leading our little troop and had quite literally just stepped over a small rise in the trail we were following which dipped down to our left. I heard a short grunt, which was followed by an enormous Sasquatch jumping out of the brush about 40 or 50 feet ahead of us. Sophia screamed, and when she did, the creature let out a loud growl. It snarled at me, showing me its teeth. My wife grabbed little Eddie as I pulled my spray canister from my belt. The beast was snarling at me with the evilest grin you could imagine. As I already had brought the canister into position to fire, if it moved any closer... I said to the family to back away slowly, and Susan said, We are not leaving you. All of them had their canisters out. As this was happening, my eyes had glanced down to the left side of where the creature had come from, and I could see the fresh, bloodied carcass of some type of animal lying on the ground. The beast's face around its jowls was wet with what I knew was blood. We had more than likely stumbled upon the creature as it was engaging in eating a kill, and it was none too happy about us being there. Perhaps it was just warning us off its kill like most predatory creatures would. The creature was snarling and curling its lips, making quick forward movements with its upper body, in a way that seemed to be somewhat of a fake that it was about to jump or leap in our direction. I guess the best way to describe it would be that of a bluff. He looked like a prize fighter who was faking a left to throw a right, if that makes any sense. I took one step backward and told the others and start doing so themselves. As we did, this beast took one large, quick step toward us, and I pulled the trigger on the canister. The cloud came out in a torrent, but fell short of the mark and had emptied rather quickly. I then told Sophia to give me her canister. When the cloud came pouring out in the direction of the beast, it lurched backward, apparently being spooked off by what had happened. Then, as quickly as it had begun, it snarled and clenched its fist, stepped back to its right to reach down to grab the animal, and disappeared into the trees. We could hear some thrashing and snapping noises as it moved away, and we turned to make our own escape while the getting was good. I was taking the rear, walking with one eye over my shoulder, and telling the others to try to move quickly and carefully. We reached the place where we had crossed the secondary road of which I spoke earlier, Having reached the road, we saw a solitary hiker coming in our direction, carrying a backpack and a long walking stick, so we waited for him. As he got closer, he hailed a hello to us, and we started to walk toward him. Sophia was clutching my wife in such a way that I guess he could tell something was wrong. And perhaps our faces told the tale as well. He asked us if everything was all right. As I began to tell him what had happened, to be honest with you, he wasn't as stunned as I believe most people would have been having heard what we just said. He said that these creatures were talked about in the region, but he personally had never seen or experienced anything of the sort. Although he knew there were others who said that they had, we introduced ourselves, and out of the kindness of his heart, he said he was going to accompany us back to our campground. I told him it wasn't necessary, but he was insistent and joined us for the hike back. This guy reminded me of Davy Crockett. He had a long graying beard with a big knife on his belt, as well as a compound bow lashed to his pack. When we had reached the camp, we all settled in for some grub with our newfound friend, whose name was Elijah Stanislaw. He said he spent weeks at a time in the woods, basically fending for himself. He also said that he had experienced and heard many strange and unusual things, including loud howls, which he could not explain, but had never seen anything the likes of what we had. I think one of the craziest things about this encounter was how quickly and easily we had come upon this beast, with neither of us nor it being aware of the other's presence, until we were virtually on top of each other. 
It also made us realize just how quickly an unfortunate and deadly bear encounter can occur with virtually no time to react. If this creature hadn't been in front of us or hadn't stopped, he could have been on us in a split second. And had it been off the trail to our left or right hand sides, it could have snatched us in an instant. This creature was about eight feet tall and four feet wide, having both enormous hands and feet. It was definitely a male, for obvious reasons, and it stunk like you can't believe. In fact, just a split second before it jumped, I had gotten a whiff of it, but it was too late. Its head was recessed into its upper body, which was massive and very muscular. The face had some hair on it, but it was very sparse and scraggly in appearance. The teeth were very stained and yellow, being mostly square in shape, with two somewhat fanged teeth protruding down from the top, similar to how a human's teeth look. To me, this was in no way a human. It simply stood on two legs and had eyes and a nose. But that's where all the similarities ended. This was a large and potentially deadly animal in my opinion, and I'm glad we escaped with our lives. On to the next story. There were two sightings, which both occurred in Blount County, Alabama. I myself have never seen a Bigfoot, but I have two reports that were told to me. These both occurred in Blount County, Alabama. The first sighting was in 1975, about two miles from the Chambly Mill Bridge. A friend of mine had just dropped me off after football practice. He was driving home on the road that crosses the bridge, this area is located in a triangle between Blountsville, Hansville, and Holly Pond. He saw a large, black or brown, hairy figure step out of the woods as he was coming around a curve. He was startled and almost wrecked his car. His story later appeared in the Cullman Times, a paper in Cullman, Alabama. He later told me that he never was more afraid in his life. He looked it right in the eyes, and it stepped back into the woods. The location he saw it is about a mile from my childhood home. The second sighting occurred on Skyball Mountain, some two to three miles from this sighting. My brother was driving alone on the road that crosses Skyball Mountain. The area has very few homes on the mountain. There are stretches of the road that are two to three miles before the house is located. The time was late evening, around 11 p.m. or later in August of 1991 or 92. He had just toppled a small rise on the road and began to smell a strong odor. He had the windows down. He looked to the right of the road and saw a large, dark figure walking through the tall weeds that were beside the road. He first thought it was a horse, but it stepped out on the road. He described it as eight feet tall, large, hairy, with no neck, coal black eyes, and covered in dark brown or black hair. He said it stared dead at him, and he stopped his car. He thought about putting the car in reverse, but instead just sat there looking at it. He said it must have stood there for a minute or longer. It smelled awful. It had long arms and large dark hair covering its hands. It just walked off into the woods on the other side of the road, and he drove home. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!